thank you everyone for coming out this afternoon and being with us. Um, I want to introduce everyone to Dr. Geneva Stark, who is our candidate that we'll be interviewing tonight. If you would, please join me for a moment of prayer if you don't mind standing. Father God, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for life, health, and strength. Lord, we just thank you and we bless you and we exalt your mighty name, Lord God. And we ask your blessings on this gathering here tonight, Lord God. We ask that you would anoint our minds, Lord, and let us be alert. Lord, anoint the candidate in it as well, Father God. And let all that we do be pleasing in your sight and let it be done for the good of the, of the students for against in city schools. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I'd like to start. I would like to introduce you to our board. To my left, Ms. Kelly Cochran, Pastor Andre Huff, Dr. Wayne Watts, Ms. Nancy Stewart, Mr. Frank Kyler, and Mr. Mike Haney. Okay. Before we start our actual questions, I would like to uh, give you an opportunity to tell us a bit about yourself. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Geneva Stark. I right now presently work for Jefferson County Public Schools in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, New Orleans, Louisiana is home for me. And um, so I am a Southern girl. <laughs> and I've been working, um, I'm very passionate about education, have been working in the business for 25 plus years. Uh, and education is near and dear to my heart, you know. And our kids, most importantly, because we have an obligation and a responsibility to make sure that our students, our students are getting the best education possible. You know. And so with that, you know, I've been a teacher, I've been a track and field coach, but more importantly, let me back up, I've been a student. So that's very important, so I know the role of that and what that looks like and what it feels like. Um, teacher, track and field coach, assistant principal, principal, high school principal, and central office administrator, and also a superintendent fellow. You know, I come to you with a wealth of information. I come to you with working in four different school districts, Jefferson County Public Schools, New Orleans Public Schools, Shelby County Public Schools, and Bullitt County Public Schools. I've um, had experience in diversity um, because in those locations, a very, very diverse student population. And right now we're living in a global, a global society. So with that, we need to think globally and make sure that all students feel inclusive. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that equity is front and center in everything we do to make sure that students have what they need to be successful. And that's, um, that's my passion. You know, I think this work is missionary work. It is not for the faint at heart. You know, we need to make sure that we do what we can for students. And sometimes um, things get in the way of that, but when it's all said and done, we're in this business with to come back and think about why are we here, you know. And the goal of why we are here is to make sure that students get a quality education. And sometimes we lose sight of that, but when we come back, to the table and make sure that we are student-centered and our philosophy is student first. And I um, love to travel, um, but being from New Orleans, I love the arts. That's, um, that's what has attracted me to Gaston City Schools. You know. It's the arts and the, and the commitment of this community to the arts. You know. So I know I'm going to some of the answers I'm going to respond to, so I need to stop there or continue. <laughs> and um, so with that, um, I'm happy to be here. I thank you all for selecting me as one of the finalists for Gaston City Schools. I am the value added leader that you need to move forward, to move this district to the next level. Thank you, Dr. Stark. I believe Mr. Haney has the first question. Dr. Stark, what we do is uh, the questions you were sent are numbered, and so each board member reads one of those questions, and and these are the stock questions, and we get through, 
then we may have some follow-up questions. Uh, I'll call them off the chart. Okay. Good deal. All right. Question one. <laughs> What do you see as the role of the superintendent as it relates to employee groups, students, the community, and the Board of Education? Okay. Number one, as the superintendent, um, my role is to be the leader of this school district, of this community. I am the person or the superintendent who will be able to connect all the different dots, all the different community groups, all the diff different partners to come together to work together as, as a school. So the superintendent of Gaston City School, which I would like to be that superintendent, is to make sure the community comes together as one and be the magnet that does that. In terms of employee groups, my role is to make sure that every employee has the resources that they need to do their job successfully. And when they are doing their job successfully, then there's accountability that goes along with that. Because we can make sure that everyone has the resources needed and then to be accountable for what they need to be, for what their job description is. For students, I will serve as their champion. I'm a champion for children. I will be their advocate. I will make sure that they have a voice in their education because they need to have a voice in their, edu in their education. They need to be able to be a part of the process. So I am the champion for children and their advocate in allowing them to have a voice in the whole process. For community, for community, my goal is to make sure that we're coming together as one. One of the things that was very notable is that several years ago, Gaston was receiving an award for uh, the All-American City. And that award was the result of community coming together, all the different agencies, to address critical issues in this community. That doesn't happen everywhere when you have everyone coming together. So, as the, so my role is to make sure that I am in the mix of that, to make sure that I'm a part of that community partners, to make sure that we can continue to move forward in addressing the education for our students. For the board, then my role is to make sure I serve the board yeah. and make sure that they have the resources that they need to implement policies and procedures, you know, to make sure that um, I am doing what the board wants, you know, and providing them with all the quality information to make sure that they can make decisions that are that's in the best interest of students. I work and serve for the Board of Education of Gaston City Schools. Okay, the, uh, as you have read, the follow-up is, uh, why do you want to come to Gadsden and a little uh, car areas? Do you know anybody here? I, yes, I know Miss Deborah Howard. I know <laughs> Mr. Dwayne Watts, right. and now I know Mr. Mike Hainer too, and um, the board members. Yes, I do. <laughs> and um, and more importantly, I know students. Those are our students. Those are our students. Yeah. You know. And so, why do I want to come to Gaston? Yeah. Gaston was, has attracted me because of the diversity that exists in this community. Again, we talk about a global society. You know, and so that is very, very attractive to me. The arts. You know, I am from New Orleans, you know, and that's when you have a, um, a community that's committed to the arts, that brings a sense of energy, you know, that brings a sense of excitement. You know. As I was reading the paper and I saw Tasha Taylor, who's going to be here, the, the daughter of Johnny Taylor, who's yeah. going to be here next weekend, I was like, whoa, I want to be here. You know, <laughs> you know, but to be able to be a part of that energy and that excitement of the arts in this community. Also, um, our students, yeah. I am one of those students that sit in the classes of Gaston City Schools. I am from New Orleans, Louisiana, a product of a lower night ward. Yeah. And that is, and for many of those students, what that means is this. Many students are being labeled based on their zip code. And people judge them based on their zip, zip code. No people, those individuals don't even know who I am. Some of us don't know who those students are, but they matter. They matter, we can make sure they matter. You know, I had the opportunity to have parents, <coughs> teachers, and coaches that provided me the opportunity to travel across this country in track and field. I ran the Madison Square Garden at the Indoor National Championships. I ran in California at the Outdoor Track and Field Championships. I was a part of two relay teams that held national records. You know. And so with that, you know, those people didn't know who I was, 
but they were judging me because of that. You know? And so as a result of that, track and field provided me with the discipline, with the commitment, the endurance and stamina to be the superintendent of Gaston City Schools. This work is missionary work. Is it hard work? Yes, it is. But that has but that track and field has provided me with that opportunity. I want to make sure that the students of Gaston City Schools, our our students, we provide that same opportunity to be successful in their lives. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> We have five quality founders for this position. Why should the board select you? The board should select me because I'm the value-added leader that they need for Gaston City Schools. Yeah. I am a person that will provide the staff. And as I, walked, as I went through schools today and saw the wealth of resources that's in Gaston City Schools, it warmed my heart because now it's like, okay, now where do we go from here? Because the resources are here, which means the commitment is here by this community. And I should be selected because I'm the person that's going to be able to take Gaston City Schools to the next level of improvement. And I want to be the change agent that can do that. Thank you. Yes, what steps would you take to create a culture of learning and high expectations among the employees in our school system? Number one is to make sure that I'm leading by example. You have to lead by example. You have to be positive, and I am a positive person. I'm a people person because it's about collaboration. It's about teamwork. It's about moving forward. It's about allowing all the stakeholders to be involved in the process. So we're empowering the staff, gas and city schools. And when people feel empowered, then they're more likely to want to be a part of the process. That brings a certain energy and a certain respect when you empower individuals. I want to be able to empower individuals. Self-direction, provide self-direction so that in giving individuals the opportunity to have a say you know, of what's going on in the process. Yeah. When staff, people, anybody feels a part that they have a say, then they're more likely to be able to be to feel valued, you know, and to feel positive, you know, to feel good about the process. Then I am the person that can do that. You know. Rewards and recognition. We need to operate from a strength. You know, we can always talk about the negatives, but what are we doing well? What are we doing well? And we're doing a lot of great things well in this district. So we should be operating and will be operating from a, operation, from a point of strength. Yeah. And when you're able to operate from strength, then those things that are negative or those things that we thought were major problems will dissipate because we're operating from a positive mindset. And that's what is needed because, again, it's about positive, you know, positivity, it's about energy, it's about moving forward. Safe schools. Making sure that every student and every staff member and everyone is working in a safe school. And judging from my tours today, we do have safe schools. And so in having safe schools, let's make sure that we provide the, the productivity necessary within the walls of those school buildings so that our students and our staff and our community can be able to see that, see those results in a positive manner. We want to be able to reward individuals yeah. and make sure that those individuals who are doing well, let's, let's do some recognition. Let's do some celebration. It's okay to celebrate. Yeah. It's okay to celebrate. It, it warms your heart when you're able to celebrate, when you're able to smile, when you're able to laugh. Then we can do that. You know? And I'm a person that loves to laugh, yeah. loves to have a good time, but also operate from the same point of taking care of business as well. We can laugh once the business is taken care of, you know, or in the process of that. But we need to make sure that we are student centric. Yeah. Motivation. When those empowerment, self direction, reward and recognition and safe skills are done, then people are motivated. They are motivated 
when they're able to, to see students, you know, who are doing well. When those students are able to feel the energy from those teachers and those staff members, because everyone has a role to play within the school district, whether it be cafeteria worker, the crossing guard, the bus driver, you know, and when everybody feels like they are a part of the operations and make learning possible, then that intrinsic motivation is there. Those are the things that I can bring to Gaston City Schools to improve the culture and the climate of our school district. Thank you. How have your previous experiences prepared you to be the superintendent of this school system? My previous experience, I'm going to focus on the things that recently. Again, as I stated earlier, I've been a student, a teacher, track and field coach, <coughs> system principal, yeah. high school principal, yeah. central office administrator, and more recently, you know, superintendent fellowship. I worked side by side with two school with two superintendents yeah. in Boyle County Public Schools and also in Shelby County Schools. Yeah. And looking at the day-to-day -day operations of what happens in the life of a superintendent, living that life with them, but addressing all the concerns that walks into a school district, whether it be board meetings whether meeting with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, looking at early college, you know, creating programs for early college, um, looking at um, a, a strategic plan, all those different things that has prepared me for why I'm here today and feeling very confident that I can lead the Gaston City Schools. And participating in early college, all the different things that happened for a superintendent, then I have been a part of the onboarding of the superintendent you know, and, the, and the training for a superintendent. I've done that in three different, uh, for the, um, I was one of four people selected in the state of Kentucky to participate in this program yeah. and prestigious uh, fellowship program. And my work as a central office administrator, I'm able to connect with individuals because that is my strength. I'm also a very good listener, yeah. but also very results oriented, results oriented as well. So that was, those are the things and the gifts that I bring to Gaston City Schools. Dr. Stubbs, describe how you would obtain support from the Board of Education for candidates that you intend to recommend for employment. Well, first of all, we need to, um, my, what I will bring to the board is first of all, a rationale for that decision. Yeah. And looking at the budget, the job description for that, um, looking at HR, you know, and with uh, human resources, and the chief financial officers to make sure that we can afford that position yeah. and see the rationale for it. For an example, yeah. right now we know students are dealing with a lot of mental health, mental health issues. So is there a need for a mental health counselor yeah. in school districts? Then what we do is that we bring, uh, bring that information to the board and the rationale for that. But first of all, more important is that what's happening now, do we have individuals in our school district that can do that job? because we want to look in before we look out, because we admit the talent and the skills may already be here in the school <coughs> district. You know, not just for, um, for mental health counselors, maybe behavior coaches, certified teachers for response to intervention, but those things that's, that's needed, then my role will be make sure that I bring that information to the school board and provide a rationale for that. Dr. Starks, I, I heard you say that your current role is Superintendent Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that role? Okay. What, did, what did you do in that role? Okay, um, that was last year. But Superintendent Fellowship is this. I was, um, the program is this. The state of Kentucky had a Superintendent Fellowship program. And what that means is that they provided you know, um, people of color an opportunity to serve as superintendents you know, in the state of Kentucky. So what that meant is I was on leave from my school district for one year. And I worked with neighboring superintendents in Bullitt County and Shelby County. But I also went through the training for superintendent. Mm -hmm. I went through the onboarding training. You know, and that onboarding, onboarding training dealt with personnel, board relations, um, budgets, finance, you know, everything, the life you know, of a superintendent. And so I was on loan for one entire year. And I 
worked, I've, I've been, I could have done one school district, but me being who I am, I wanted to make sure I had the experience of working in two school districts, uh, and one was 7,000, one was 13,000, but they were very different from Jefferson County Public Schools. Jefferson County Public Schools consists of 102,000 students of 176 school sites. You know. So I want to make sure that I want to get some additional experiences. So that superintendent fellowship allowed me to be able to have that experience. I attended um, the National School Boards Association meeting. I attended the American Association of School Administrators. So I was able to obtain those experiences and live the life of a superintendent in two school districts. Okay, thank you for explaining that. Um, Discuss the most difficult personnel problem you have ever dealt with and how you received it. Okay. Well, I can mention two things. The first thing I want to mention is that as an assistant principal at a high school, we had a principal that had, had to be removed because of some improprieties that happened. It made news all over the district, all over the radio, TV, you know, it was big news. And so as I went back, we went back to the school the next day, of course, everyone is excited. Kids upset, teachers upset, everyone's crying, parents trying to figure out what's going on. I was the least senior administrator at that time. And everybody got engaged in the stuff, in the gossip, in the rhetoric. And for me, it was like, wait a minute, time out. We are an educational institution. Our role is to make sure our students get a quality education. So I stepped up and I said, I need you to do this. I need you to go over here. I need you to go back in the classroom. This is still a school day. This is still an instructional school day. So therefore, we need to make sure that our students get a quality education. I'll take care of this other business. But right now, we're going to get some order and some control you know, in the school building. And so as a result of that, you know, and it was just something that needed to be done. Uh, and as a result of that, then I was asked to serve as interim principal and then became principal. And it wasn't something that I was looking for, but it was something that needed to be done because no one has stepped up to bring some calm to the whole situation. So that was something that was, you know, that happened. That was a personal <coughs> issue. And with that, then I ended up talking to the, um, the auditors and the different people that need to investigate. So that was a major um, personnel issue for me. <clears throat> One thing that's also, and that every school district in the country deals with, is how do we recruit and develop and retain teachers? <coughs> because as we know, there is many people are not going to education. But what innovative ways are we going to use to attract teachers? So. What we've begun to do is that we have alternative certification programs that we have in place. And what that means is that individuals who have a degree can come to the school district and we have classes for them to take and that's been approved by the state. So they can become a certified teacher without paying a dime. That has yielded dividends for us. Also, we have another program that's an alternative certification program with the universities. Yeah. That student, that teachers are able to, or individuals are able to get alternative certification certificates for three years. Yeah. Now last year they have to do an internship. So that has yielded us many benefits. Recently we began looking at the military bases. There are a lot of individuals who are getting ready to retire from the military. Many people have not tapped into that resource. So we've gone to the military base, and those individuals have been interested. And so we begin to hire those individuals to get to become in the classroom and provide the training necessary, because it just can't come in, but we have to provide the professional development necessary to make sure, because we want to retain them as well. That has yielded us major benefits. So that's always a personnel issue, is how do we make sure that we continue to develop, recruit, develop, and retain teachers. So those are the two things that, in personnel, that I have experienced and worked with and have been intimately involved in. Thank you. Dr. Stark, what are your expectations 
for learning, for student achievement? My expectations is that every student in the Gaston City Schools graduate prepared for college, career, the workforce, or military. We should provide, make sure that every student <coughs> is prepared. So my expectation is that every student graduates from high school and also to become a productive citizen as well. And do you believe that all children can, can learn at high levels? Yes, they can learn at high levels. They may not be able to learn at the same pace as everyone. And that's where we come in as the educators to make sure that we have programs in place for them. And those programs can be response to intervention. They can be enrichment programs. You know, those are things that we need to do to make sure that we continue to <coughs> have students to continue to learn because all of us don't learn at the same pace. And we are successful adults. So let's not label kids in that way where they feel inferior because we all have walked that line uh, as well. What approaches would you pursue specifically addressing the middle population of students? Yes, that middle population. And I would say that most of us may have been in the middle, you know, but we are here today, you know, and we know that the, the high flyers, they're going to make it. Mm -hmm. Then a lot of attention is on the lowest, lower achieving students. But what are we doing for the middle population? For the middle population, what we put in place is enrichment programs. Well, first of all, we need to track every, we need to name and claim every student naming them and claiming every student, which means that you know what their assessment is. You know what that data looks like. And when that happens, then you begin to put systems in place to help and support them. And naming and claiming is like putting a response to intervention program for those students who, are, who may be, they maybe have done very well in math, but they may need a reading intervention. Then we put systems in place for that. Those students who are in the middle, just, they may need just an enrichment program. And sometimes we have students who are just unmotivated. They could be your genius. They could be your genius, mm -hmm. but they have not been inspired. Mm -hmm. They have not been connected. So let's make sure that every student is connected to something yeah. or to someone, whether it be a program, yeah. a club, athletic team. Yeah. Um, let's make sure, or the arts. Let's make sure that every student is connected, yeah. and we can do that. Yeah. And many times I had a conversation today. You know, we have a lot of young people who are sitting in institutions, correction institutions, because they were not connected to anyone. No one noticed them. No one bothered, you know. We can't afford to do that. That's our workforce. Those are individuals that we care about. That is somebody's child. So, so let's make sure that we are connecting with every student you know, in the Gaston City Schools. And we can do that, it's possible. But we have to be systemic, and we have to be intentional <coughs> about that. And when that happens, we're gonna see the difference in kids. Because we're gonna see some students who, um, we didn't even know was gifted. We didn't know that they was talented. But somebody shared some insight with them. Somebody just had a conversation with them. So those are the things, you know, that we can do for them. Early college, we have students that can leave high school with an associate degree. Why not? We have a partnership with Gaston State Community College. Why not let that happen? That can happen. So we want to make sure that those students know that yeah. and also the parents know that <clears throat> because many times we have to make sure our, our community is educated about that because what happens is everyone thinks it's about a four-year college. That's the only way somebody can be successful. But there's a need for plumbers. Yeah, I just paid a bill for two hundred dollars, and they was there for twenty minutes. <laughs> I'm like, what? What did you do? You know. And so those, you know, carpenters, bricklayers, HVAC, they can leave high school with making, making lucrative jobs, making more money than we are making. You know? But we need to make sure that they know about those opportunities, and we expose those students to those opportunities, not only the students, 
but also the community at large. Because we think four years, and we have a lot of students that's leaving college in four years with a lot of debt, but no job. Yeah. And they went there because their parents told them to go, <laughs> and they didn't do what they wanted to do. So let's make sure that we're addressing, that students have a voice in what's going on. So early college, you know, we have students that can be or CTE programs, you know, um, athletic programs. And with that, we have schools that every sponsor, every coach, whether it be the wide receiver <coughs> coach, the shot put coach, the basketball coach, they know the GPA of every student. They know the GPA of every student. Because that student's not just there for athletics. Yeah. They are student athletes. Yeah. So we want to make sure that those sponsors, yeah, we just don't want them just to be involved in activity. We want to tap into the whole entire child. So we want to make sure their grades are where they're supposed to be. So those are the different opportunities that we can provide to those middle of the road students that sometimes get lost in the shuffle and too many of them are getting lost in the shuffle and they're making wrong decisions because no one has touched them, no one's connected with them. Thank you. This is, <coughs> you've answered, <coughs> excuse me, you've answered part of this, but this is a more uh, question addressed to more specifics. We're committed to closing the achievement gap and increasing graduation rates. Mm -hmm. Tell us what successes you've had in that area and what you would do here to close the achievement gaps and improve the graduation rate. When we have gaps in schools, it's not just upon the local school. As a superintendent, then the cabinet has to provide direct support to schools. And providing direct support means that we're just not saying, oh, well, it's on the school, it's on the teacher. As a superintendent, we need to make sure that everyone is involved, That's, that the central office is not disconnected from schools. We need to make sure that the, that, the, that the cabinet members know exactly what's happening in school and provide schools with those resources that they need to be successful. Central office will answer to the schools by providing them with the necessary resources. We're going to make sure that the curriculum is aligned because we also have a curriculum department. We have many departments at central office. So they are just as accountable as the local school is. And then we make sure, or well, I make sure that we are, have walkthroughs that are more importantly visible. Yeah. Because when you're visible, then you're demonstrating that you care and you're concerned about what's going on. Yeah. And you want, you have high expectations. So the goal is to make sure that we have high expectations. And also we're intentional. We are intentional about the work. Because many times people are just working, they're working hard, but they're not working on the work that needs to be done. And so they're spinning their wheels, they're sweating and huffing and puffing and I can't do it anymore. Well, let's step back and look at what we're doing. Are we disaggregating the data the way it needs to be? Are we looking at real problems? No. Or are we just spinning our wheels? We can no longer, we can't do that. We need to make sure that we're intentional about the work and that we are focusing on the right things. And we're also asking the right questions. What is the why? Why is this happening? Yeah. Why? What is the why? And also asking our stakeholders to be involved in that process because it's not just about me, it's a team. Yeah. We are all working together as one for the common good. And we put systems in place to make sure that happens by central office, talking to schools, cabinet levels, talking to schools, being visible, and also doing walkthroughs as well to know exactly what's going on. And ongoing monitoring. We need to make sure that we're monitoring exactly what's happening <coughs> for checkpoints. Are we holding individuals accountable? Yeah. We have to. Let, that let me, well, yes, ma'am, that, uh, that was well stated, but I'm, I'm interested, or we're interested in your specific experience mm -hmm. at a school or okay. somewhere you have done uh, a program that improved okay. the achievement gap okay. or improved the graduation yeah. rate. I, um, Can you move the mic a little closer, please? And some people can hear in the back. 
Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, I have been involved in principal preparation, you know, um, in looking at data to make sure that we improve the graduation rate, you know, by again looking at what the data states, you know, and providing the programs necessary for students to be able to graduate. Now, types of programs, you know, CTE program, which is Career Technical Education program, is a wonderful program to inspire students to graduate because you're giving them something to work with. You now, response to intervention programs, we have put in place to make sure students have the, 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 um, the math intervention, the reading intervention that they need, but also making sure that we're naming and claiming every student. If we have counselors that need to make sure that students, that we know where students are, and we're communicating with parents. We are communicating with parents to let parents know exactly where they are. We're also communicating with students, because oftentimes, the adults are talking, no one is talking to the students. They have a role and a voice to play in their education and to make sure that they are utilizing that. You know, so when we, for me, you know, I made sure that the counselors were connected with the students, you know, made sure conversations with students about their life and their careers and where we want them to go, their pathway. And so our principal preparation programs, looking, working with principals to analyze the data. And so with all of that, those are the things that's necessary to improve the graduation rate because then we are monitoring that throughout the whole entire year to make sure they are on a path <coughs> to graduation. Dr. Starr, describe your experience in developing, implementing, and evaluating curriculum and instituting programs to raise student achievement. My work has been with creating curriculum for classes. For every course, there was a curriculum to make sure that it's systemic across grade levels. Yeah. That if I walk into a ninth grade math cl algebra class, then the same, if I walk across the hall, we're looking at the same curriculum. Yeah. If I walk into, you know, we're not doing two different things. So we created class curriculums for every content that was taught in the school building to make sure that it's systemic across the board. That was developing, you know, then implementing is to make sure that we made sure that everyone was implementing that curriculum by walkthroughs, you know, watch, looking at what the teachers were doing. And if they needed help, providing support to them. So we have teachers, we have master teachers, we have goal clarity coaches, you know, we have math and um, reading intervention teachers. So we have those things in place to help teachers. And also evaluation of curriculum. We evaluate the curriculum by use of test scores, whether it be the, the math data or the state test scores, we're looking at how we evaluate that. So we evaluate that to raise test scores. So we looked at, there was ongoing engagement and evaluation, provide, providing professional development for administrators and for teachers. But more important, we need to make sure that when we say deeper learning, what does that mean to each and every person in that school building, each and every person in the school district? Because deeper learning can mean different things to different people. So we need to make sure everyone know exactly what that means. When we talk about project-based learning, what does that mean? Yeah. We need to make sure that we are clear about the language yeah. and the content you know, of those different programs. So my experience has been in implementing the program, or well, developing the program, has been in implementing, evaluating those instructional programs. And so also providing professional learning communities so that teachers have the opportunity to have a common planning period, you know, to be able to work together, to look at those, the curriculum that we have in place for them, for each classroom. So my experience has been 
in implementing, developing, implementing, and evaluating curriculum. Thank you. What do you think is the role of the career technical education? Career technical education is very, very important. It's vitally important for two reasons. Yeah. We're giving students an opportunity to look at post-secondary um, curriculum, uh, post-secondary certificates, as I stated earlier. Whether you can be a plumber, a bricklayer, you can be a um, HVAC, yeah. and um, technology. You have all of those different things, and it's a wonderful opportunity for students because every student may not want to go to a four-year college. But also, we have a workforce that's saying, we need individuals to work in manufacturing. We need carpenters. And so with that, that is very important because I've been able to see students work for Habitat for Humanity in building homes. I've seen students in automotive classes have been able to work on vehicles. I've seen students in, um, doing the welding classes so they're able to leave with a welding certificate. So those are quality programs that can benefit our student yeah. And even if they want to continue on with post-secondary education, they can, but they have the skills already to work that job while they're pursuing something else. Yeah. So career and technical education, yeah. it's a part of the whole educational process, and it should be a part of the educational process. Yeah. And we need to make sure that the community knows that, that students know that, yeah. and I'm excited about that because I've seen the work. I've been a part of the work that happens. I've been able to see you know, students really excel. I've seen students who are happy and excited about that. Yes, we should provide them that opportunity. We should expose them to those opportunities. And, um, and as I toured today at Gaston City High School and was able to see some of those resources here yeah. in this building, most people can't say they have that. They have a piano lab. Wow. <laughs> you know, they have automotive, HVAC, electrical. You know, most places can't say they have that. And Gaston City Schools, we have that. So let's take advantage of that. Career technical education and then what we have here to make sure that the workforce and the students can partner together to make it happen. <laughs> I was at the mayor's office today and I see a genuine commitment you now. Partners that's willing to help and support, that, is, that doesn't happen <coughs> everywhere. It's a golden opportunity to make sure that we continue to take advantage of those resources here in Gaston City Schools. So, so what I think about career and technical education? <laughs> I think it's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. What stress do you have in the area of financial management, including budget development and ongoing fiscal management? And please give concrete examples. Okay. Budget development and fiscal management. As a superintendent fellow, I worked on the budget again, two school districts, and looking at the trend data, looking at expenses and expenditures, what we have, what we're spending our money on, yeah. and making sure that what we're spending our money on is aligned with our mission statement, with our strategic plan, making sure the resources are aligned with the budget. Looking at a five-year projection that we have, because we want to forecast, where are we? You know, where are we going? You know, what can we expect from taxes? You know, is there companies coming in the area that's going to be able to provide additional taxes to the school district? So I was able. To, I was being. A, I was a part of the budget committees for two different school districts and know about what was happening, what that looks like, you know, and what it feels like. You know, so. When I say, when, when I make the statement about is our resources aligned with our budget? Yeah. We had a program called the Bellarmine Literacy Project 
And what that was was a third grade, and what it is, is a third grade reading pledge. We want, to, we want to make sure that every student is reading by the third grade level. Because we know that if they're not, then the likelihood of them graduating from high school is not there. They have individuals building prisons based on third grade reading. So we have to make a commitment, and we've made a commitment to make sure that every student is reading at the third, third grade level. Behavior coaches, those students who are traumatized, and we have many, that some students are dealing with a whole lot of different things that we may not otherwise have experienced. But we have to address it, so we need mental health counselors. And we have put mental health counselors in the budget. Again, those are things that, that's, in your, that's in, your, um, in your strategic plan but you need to make sure that the, find that the budget is aligned with that. So I was a part of the budget you know, for our two different school districts, and we put resources in place for new items. We looked at the five-year projection. We looked at um, the revenue trend. We made, we made major, major changes in looking at programs. <coughs> what programs are working? What's not working? So it is clear that we need to make sure that there's ongoing evaluation of programs. And so, again, that goes under the budget to make sure that we are, we are using our money fiscally. We're fiscally sound. We're using it with fidelity. Yeah. And um, as I said when earlier about if there's a recommendation for a position that we make sure that it's within the budget. We make sure that there's a rationale for it. All those things that come with the budget and making sure that we are very clear about expectations and how we use our money because we all have experienced budget cuts. So every dollar that we spend, it must be a rationale for it. So have been a part of the, the budget process. Also, a part of my work was to put together a superintendent handbook on how to budget and manage money in the school district. Yeah. One of the things that's very, very important is that we trust, but we verify. We trust, but we verify. There's been a lot of school districts and organizations that trusted too much. <laughs> there needs to be a segregation of duties that we know that the same person that's writing the check is not going to cash the check in somebody else's name. <laughs> yeah. So making sure that all those different things are in place because that's a part of budget and making sure our money is protected at all costs. So those are some of my experiences with budget you know, and the budgeting process. Dr. Starks, please uh, describe your experience with uh, strategic planning. Strategic planning. One of my roles was to facilitate the strategic plan for Bullitt County Public Schools. There was not a plan in place. And they had not had a plan in nine years. <laughs> so it's starting from scratch, being able to look at a timeline, talking to all the stakeholders, having a meeting with community leaders, teachers, students, the community at large, yeah. having meetings with board members, yeah. looking at the goals of what we want in our plan. What does it look like in our plan? But more important that everyone needs to know how they, what their role is in the process. Everyone needs to know that they feel valued. So when they pick up that plan, then they know, oh, this is where I fit in. This is, you know, as the bus driver, I'm responsible for making learning possible. My role is to make sure that those students get to the school building safely. The cafeteria workers, they know that my role is to make sure that those students are fed. Yeah. The teachers in the classroom, to make sure that I'm providing the best instruction for those students. Yeah. As the administrative team, to make sure that we're providing resources for those teachers so that they can do their job successfully. 
you know, and central office administrators, making sure that professional development and money is put in place so that they can, the goals can align with the resources. So my experience with the strategic plan was building it from scratch yeah. and making sure all the stakeholders had a role in the process. And the final outcome was to, it was a document that everyone knew what their role was. And also what I found in working with the plan is sometimes people don't feel like they're respected. So I had to pull people in. And even though they were physically there, I had to say, I need you to talk to me. I need, you to, I need to know what you're doing. I need to know what you're feeling from the social worker, from the uh, director of people personnel, yeah. from uh, getting the bus driver, because sometimes people don't feel valued. Everyone needs to know that they have a role to play in Gaston City Schools yeah. and that what their role is and how it connects <clears throat> with student achievement in the school district. Because if they don't, they'll sit back. And when students are, you never know who students are going to connect with. You never know who that person is. It could be the maintenance person. It could be the bus driver. But they need to feel valued. Because when they feel valued, then they're going to share that information with students. One of the things that happened in my experiences, even with I um, had a large ESL population when I was in the school building, and like 125 students from 50 different countries speaking various different languages. And to be able to see those individuals, I had to first tell them, you're not a visitor here. This is your school, <laughs> like it is everyone else's school. Yeah. Had to acquire staff to mirror the student population. Yeah. And with all of that, but it takes intention. It takes focus. It takes making sure that everyone feels valued. You know, and in that, they were able to feel a part of it. And the defining moment for me one morning was knowing that, okay, it's happening. You know, when one of the young ladies, she was an African American student, she came to see me. You know, while I was at the loading dock, she got off the bus. You know, the bus driver told this student that if she doesn't speak English, she can't speak at all on her bus. Like what? You know. So I'm like, okay, baby, you know, now tell me that again. <laughs> and so the bus driver had told a student that if you can't speak English, you can't speak on my bus. Yeah. And she knew that that wasn't what it was supposed to be. <clears throat> I thanked her for bringing it to my attention, yeah. not going off on the bus driver, <laughs> yeah. but that knew that that was a moment that when we all became one, when we all were inclusive, the same thing with adults. When you have adults walking in the school buildings and not able to say good morning, good afternoon, you know, we are all in this together. And when students, students, they're watching us. They are watching. They know all of it, you know. So we need to make sure that we all are on the same page, that everyone feels valued in this school district. And we need to model that, you know, every day, you know. So that's leading by example and bring everyone together so they know what their role is in this school district. When that happens, then we all are one. Then we can move in the right direction and kids are going to be able to prosper and excel because they know that we all in this together. So, um, strategic planning, that's a part of that whole process. You know, Waking up staff and saying that you're valued. You know, and again, systemically, going through creating a timeline, meeting with individuals and bringing all those individu individuals together, not just one time, but several times, because it's, it's a process, you know, and it took six to seven months, but we were strategic because we wanted to make sure that we, everyone was able to bring their perspective and we had goals, you know, in the, you know that we, that was very, very important that need, that we need to have. So that's my experiences from scratch, from nothing to a document, and a living and breathing document. Because we need to make sure that it's monitored. We need to make sure that if we need to modify it, then let's modify it. Yeah. But don't just let it sit on the shelf and collect dust.
bunch of starts. When a new superintendent is hired, you want the transition to go over pretty smooth for everyone. How would you get the education community and the community at large to adopt to your government style? Well, it's not about me, it's about us, and it's about students, but I need to be visible in the community, visible in school buildings, yeah. uh, <coughs> uh, visible in various organizations because, again, one of the things that's, that was very attractive with Gaston is that the community is connected. The community look at critical, re critical issues that address student achievement. And so for the superintendent, for me, it will be making sure that everyone, everyone is clear about the expectations. And as I stated earlier about making sure that when we say deeper learning, everyone knows what deeper learning is. We, if we say project-based learning, everyone knows what that is. If we say career and technical education, everyone knows what that is. And being able to share that with the community in various places. Having town, town hall meetings, yeah. reaching out to the community because it's not two separate entities, we all are one. So it's very, very important that my role as a superintendent is to be visible in the community and to go out there and speak about the expectations of Gaston City Schools to make sure that we are continuing to establish partnerships and maintain those partnerships in the community. So that's what I would do. And with that, then everyone would know what my expectations are as the superintendent for Gaston City Schools. Because it should be clear, it should not be something to my, I think she meant this. No, it should be very clear about what the expectation is. Let me ask this question. Um, what do you, how would you get the naysayers to buy you? You know, you have a different governance style than probably the current okay. superintendent, okay? okay? You come in with your governing style, mm -hmm. and it's a little different, mm -hmm. and a lot of people may have been in this system a long time. Mm -hmm. How would you get them to kind of adapt to it or adjust to it, as well as the community that felt like it wasn't broke, so why fix it? Okay. But you coming in and you trying to take it further, take our education system in a, in a, in a different direction, and you trying to make it more successful. Mm -hmm. And, but you know, you can't get people, there are some people that you have naysayers that may not want to buy in. How do you get them to adjust to it? We have naysayers. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, first of all, coming in, my role will be to listen, to learn, and then to lead. That will be my nine day plan, yeah. is to listen to those naysayers, to listen to what people have, to what people have to say. and. Let's be positive. I'm going to be, I am a positive person. And so I'm not going to allow individuals to go there because we can wallow all day long. But what are we going to do about it? What's going to be the action plan? And the number one goal is student achievement. Yeah. And we have to be student centered. So yes, for those individuals, because it's not with just the naysayers, but with everyone. Because yes, everyone is always resistance to change. That's life. Yeah. And so how do we go about, how would I go about doing that? Listening to everyone, being visible, going to school buildings, having conversations, and maybe having repeated conversations, and maybe having a third conversation, <laughs> or a fourth conversation, but whatever it takes to make sure that, now, sometimes you're not gonna get 100% of the individuals, but if they care enough about students, and remember why, they went into this profession, and most people are going to say is to make a difference in the lives of young people or to students. And that difference did not, was not based on skin color, was not based on um, whether their zip code, was not based on, oh, I don't feel like it is too hard and blah, blah, blah. You want to make a difference. So let's make sure that we keep that at the forefront of what we're doing, you know, and that, that is the why, because we all want to see students be productive, you know. So I would have 
repeated conversation. My number one is to be visible and have high expectations. Yeah. And having those high expectations to make sure that I'm providing the resources for those high expectations. Yeah. But also to have con ongoing conversations because, again, sometimes it takes others, some longer than others, to climb on board. And even if we, and if some don't ever, but they're doing what they're doing, but they're doing enough to make sure that it's not affecting the lives of young people. And so the goal is to have those conversations. And I have the courage to have those conversations. And I can have those conversations. Dr. Stark, you spoke about diversity, mm -hmm. and this community is a diverse community. Yes. How would you work to ensure that all groups are fully engaged with the schools and the system as a whole? Mm -hmm. um, again, leading by expectation and making sure that everyone feels inclusive. So with that, when we are publishing documents, then it can be in multiple languages that there's an intentional effort to be able to go out and reach those communities and say, you know, we want you here. You're not a visitor. Let's, let's, let's work on this. When we see students, we're looking at data, and we've seen students who are not successful, then what is the why in that? You know? So my role would be, you know, to make sure that we as a district, that we are in tune to that, you know, that we are inclusive, because we have many parents that say, they don't really want me over there. <laughs> when I walk into a school building, you know, they just blew me off. If I asked a question, they didn't want to talk to me, or they just put me off to someone else. We need to be customer friendly. Mm -hmm. We need to know who our customers are. Yeah. And so with that, then working with the communications department, working with the school employees to say, okay, you know, no one wants to feel isolated. That is not a good feeling. So with that, let's make sure that we are mindful of how we're treating individuals. And again, my role would be visibility, communication, ongoing communication, letting everyone know you are valued. And again, we have a global community, which is representative of a global society. And that is the world in which we live in. So that's what my role would be. Thank you. Would you like to have a swallow of water? I would suggest yes, a small you. one since Dr. Howard says we don't have potty. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take a sip. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am, you've been talking for a long time. Um, let's see, this is question number 15. Okay. Describe specific strategies you would use to promote public support for school activities, budget, and, in, and, and instructional programs. Okay. I'm sorry, repeat that question again. I'm trying to see what's sure. selected. Specific strategies to promote public support for school activities, mm -hmm. uh, budget, instructional program. Okay. I know it's that's a broad range. Okay. Of things. Uh, I think it's important that we as a school district that we are we're able to um, or that we're not able but we do we, we let people know what we're doing we celebrate what we're doing oftentimes and that means if there is a if the band is performing if the choir is performing, if we have a governor's scout that's going on, or if we have a football game or a basketball game, or we have activities going on, or even we have a budget meeting that's happening, that we make sure that this is public knowledge. Yeah. And in, in talking with the mayor today, he said there's an opportunity for us to put that kind of information on the broadcast so that everyone can see it. Yeah. We need to make sure that that is visible, that people know exactly what's happening we can also invite individuals in. One of the things that that was um, that we did or that I did was we had a we had a, a prom for parents. We had many parents who had not attended their high school prom for whatever reason. 
activities to get, stu to get community members in the school building. And that was something that was amazing. The turnout was great because we didn't know that. We just said, let's, let's do this. Let's try some new things. Let's try some different things. And the parents came in their gowns, <laughs> their tuxedos, and they had a wonderful time. Yeah. So we talked about activities, you know, budget meetings, that we make sure all of that information is on our website in multiple languages, to my Facebook, Twitter. We use all of those mediums to make sure that parents and community know exactly what's going on. Sometimes individuals in the school district don't know what's going on. So uh, let's make sure that there's communication, that that communication is horizontal, diagonal, you know, vertical, whatever it needs to, whatever it needs to be. But we need to make sure that, you know, that we're operating with transparency, we're operating with knowledge, we're operating with people knowing exactly what's going on in our school district, and whether it be the budget meeting whether it be the strategic plan, whether it be school activities, that everyone knows exactly what's going on in the school district. Because then if we have it, our stakeholders um, can be able to come in and lend their support because we want them in. Yeah. So we have town hall meetings to be able to share with them this is what's happening in our school. And I think it's important that we have town hall meetings in various parts of the community not just at central office, yeah. but in various parts of the communities because for whatever reason, some individuals may not be able to get. Yeah. And so we were able to do that and we do that. And that has proved to be very, very successful. So making sure that everything is transparent. Did I answer that question, Mr. Haney? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> uh, share with us and explain of when you were especially innovative in addressing a funding gap? One um, thing comes to mind, important thing comes to mind. We were, had just um, gotten the status, as I was a high school principal at the time, of becoming a math science technology school. And of course, we got the status, but of course all the resources were not available as well that came with that. So what we did, we um, applied for a grant with General Electric. And we acquired the grant, it was a 10 year grant. So we became a GE school. And with, those, with the funding, we was able to elevate and enhance the program. We were able to purchase calculators we were able to purchase additional microscopes. We were able to purchase you know, uh, staff members with those funds. But also, you know, so those are th the things that we did. But also for students, we were able to pay for their ACT test because some families were not able to do that. So the GE grant provided the monies for that. Yeah. So we were able to, students were able to um, grades for scholars. So when they achieved an A, their money went into the school bank for them. So when they left high school, they was able to take that money with them to go to, and use that money for books or for whatever they wanted, you know, but some parts of, of tuition. But acquiring that GE grant was a wonderful opportunity. It was a saving grace for the school because it allowed us to do some activities and different things and purchase programs and have additional staff so that we can be excited about the program. Because we just didn't want it in name only. We want to be able to actively, you know, be in, have kids involved in the math and science activities, you know, in the school, you know, in our school. And they did. So that's thank you. Okay. How would you how have you held student staff members accountable for student achievement while balancing the demands put on our teachers? Balancing is, um, I'm sorry, say that question again. 
How have you held staff members accountable for student achievement while balancing the demands put on teachers? Staff members are held accountable, and as I stated earlier, that is not just the teachers, but we're talking about central office, that we are responding to the local school. And as we responded, we're looking at data because, of course, we all live in the world of tests and assessment, so we have to look at test scores and map data. But with that, we're also looking at how do we measure that, you know? And with those teachers, that with the balancing act is that if we have a teacher that's struggling, then we provide support. Because we don't want to lose teachers, you know? And a part of recruiting is not just recruiting, but retaining. And so you retain by, by, by providing professional development so they can be successful. So we make sure that teachers have common planning periods, you know, so that they can collaborate. Yeah. We have something that's called professional learning communities where they're able to collaborate and look at test but also to support each other in that process. Now, yeah. as we continue to support, also comes accountability because we just can't, you know, with that as we're providing support, we want to be able to see some results, you know, as well. Yeah. So providing support while we are balancing that act. And that means that everybody's involved in the process. There are walkthroughs to see, you know, where are we? What's happening in classrooms on an ongoing basis? Not just once a year, you know, twice a year, but it's on an ongoing basis to make sure that as we put those systems in place, and those resources in place that we've seen the benefits. It's also students. Student achievement is first and, for, first and foremost. What are the test scores? And if students are not achieving from one semester to the other, what is the why? Are we doing the same things we've always done and expect a different result? What are we doing? What is the why? So examining that, identifying that, and also we have to be intentional about instruction. Yeah. What are we actually doing to make a difference? Yeah. And so sometimes it, yeah, as we're providing resources, but also we are monitoring that process, you know, as well. Right. And you. supporting teachers. Thank you. Dr. Stark, as we select the new superintendent for Gadsden City Schools, what are the top three strengths or attributes that you believe you bring that our district could benefit from? As the superintendent of Gaston City Schools, what I bring to the table is three things. I am a collaborator, yeah. I am decisive, and accountable. When I say collaborator, it's about being able to make decisions, promotes independent thinking, and action, yeah. effective leader with a diverse community, making sure that everyone is involved in the process. Yeah. And I'm a listener. But as I'm a listener, then it does not mean that things don't happen. <laughs> you know, we listen and we learn and we move forward. But a collaborator, making sure that we bring everyone to the table, so that is one of my strengths. Decisive, yeah. being able to make a decision, when a decision needs to be made, and not being afraid to make it, yeah. having the courage to make it, and as Reverend Huff stated, sometimes everyone may not like a decision, but a decision has to be made. Yeah. And so we cannot run from that, because again, we talk about the lives of students. So I am a decision maker. I am decisive. Yeah. I have very good organizational skills in that yeah. <clears throat> to make sure that when I'm making decisions, that is with the right information. It's not just off the cuff, but making sure I have all the information necessary to make those decisions. Accountability. I take ownership in what, I, what I'm being held accountable for. I have the courage to be able to make the tough decisions where they need to be made, to delegate and to hold individuals accountable for that. So the three gifts, 
that I bring, collaboration, decisiveness, and accountability. Thank you, Dr. Stark. Do we have additional uh, questions from board members? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> To uh, follow up on that question, and I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, many times we ask someone, if we ask your colleagues, to tell us your strengths and tell us your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. If you ask my colleagues, they'll say, well, he shows up on time, but boy, he doesn't have much patience. So mm -hmm. what, what would you, you describe what you perceive to be your strengths? What would your colleagues say your weaknesses are, Dr. Stark? They wouldn't. They probably would say she doesn't have any. <laughs> but you know, they uh, know my heart, know my passion. Yeah, um, I can't say that they would say anything negative about me because they know I, my I, my walk is my talk. My talk is my walk. Yeah, I walk in peace. You know, I walk with courage, walk with collaboration, walk with the passion. That is about students, uh, and this is missionary work, and work that I do not take lightly. So, I can't say that they will say anything negative about me. <clears throat> Have you reviewed the uh, strategic plan that this board adopted for the Gadsden City yes, Schools? Yes, I have. Do you have any comments on it? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's, um, no, I mean, I looked at the goals. And I believe in simplicity. Yeah. I think it's to the point. The goal is, what's the action plan? Let's make sure that's put into place in action. So based on looking at test scores, there's work to be done. Yeah. And I think that um, we can move forward, but no. What do you see as the strengths of the Gaston system? Gaston City Schools? Yes, ma'am. Oh, the strength is the commitment that this community has in working together on critical issues. Yeah, that is the strength of this community. The strength is having the resources in the school district that can, you know, that's, that's there already. The strength is um, a, a staff and people that's, look, I mean, the people here today that care about the, about the decision of who the next superintendent is going to be in this school district. Yeah, so the strength is that a community that want to see our students be successful. They want to see every student graduate from high school, college ready, career ready, life ready, with the workforce or the military. So that is a strength for this community. Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions? You good? Any other questions? Dr. Stark, thank you so much. And we have uh, questioned you a lot today, so we're going to give you an opportunity to question us. Right. Do you have any questions for us? Okay. Let me take a, can I take a sip? Sure. <laughs> Help yourself. Did you say yes? Yes. Did you I, say yes? Be, I sure did. I said, help yourself. Um, what I would like to know, uh, what, is the, what are you all looking for? What is the timeline? I know that the timeline was, has been altered, and when are you going to make a decision? When would you like to see the, the next superintendent in place? And I hope to receive that phone call very soon so I can pack my bags. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to report for duty. I like a direct person. <laughs> we are meeting as of today, I asked for a call meeting for next Thursday, okay. and we as a board will decide where we go from there. So I can't give you an exact time of when the decision will be made, but I am saying that we are working on it. And, and this is something, just to share with you, this is definitely a new procedure or process for this community. This is the first time we've had really a, a superintendent search, an actual search. 
So I'm asking all of you all to kind of work with us because this is this is new. This is new for us. We need to have a superintendent in place definitely by July 1, but hopefully much sooner than that. I'm hoping. Any other questions? No, I don't have any other questions. Okay. <laughs> I do. I like your directness because I'm a direct person as well. Um, but we want to thank you for your interest in Gaston City Schools. And I need to do some housekeeping right now because uh, you are our final, you're, you're the last candidate that we've interviewed. And, and um, I want to thank everyone that has helped in this process. Uh, we have so many staff members that have done yeoman's work in order to, and stayed after school to, in order to provide refreshments and uh, accommodations for us. Ms. Holland, I want to thank you for your faithfulness. And uh, the city, definitely the city, the mayor and the city for providing the, the um, taping and the access to these interviews for our community. I want to thank the community at large for your interest and, and, and your participation in this process because it helps us to know that you are concerned that, that this is important to you as it is very vitally important to us. And I appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Thank you all the board members. I know this has been uh, rather demanding and we definitely had to come out and meet more than we we're used to meeting, but I do appreciate your faithfulness in doing that as well. Having said that, we, there are some refreshments in the back. I, I apologize again for the lack of facilities, but please come forward and meet the candidate and um, get to know her better, please. And thank you again. And I want to thank you all for providing me an opportunity to be here today. I do have a 100-day um, entry plan, you know, to provide to you. So my entry plan for my first 100 days as the superintendent of Gaston City Schools.